Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Central Asia Metals PLC uh, Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we will notify you when they are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll and if you could give that your attention, we'd be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Nigel Robinson, CEO. Good afternoon to you, Nigel. Yeah, good afternoon and thank you very much to uh, to all the listeners for listening in this afternoon on our 2020 results, uh, which we're calling a decade of delivery. Why a decade of delivery? Well, if September 2010 was when we listed uh, on the alternative investment market and raised $60 million on an IPO. So we've effectively been post IPO for 10 years and it was our anniversary last year. So just moving through the slides, standard disclaimer, first of all. Um, read that at your leisure, if indeed you can read it from, from the screen. Uh, and moving on to the highlights of these 2020 results. We had a strong year in what were very challenging conditions, effectively with COVID-19, uh, and also an incident we had on site at SASA in September of 2020. Despite all that, we came in with good production numbers. You can see the numbers there. Close to 14,000 tonnes of copper. 30,000 tonnes of lead and 23,815 tonnes of zinc in production, uh, sorry, in concentrate at SASA. So good production numbers. Um, we didn't have any incidents on either side, so zero LTIs, which leads to what's known as a zero LTIFR, which is the frequency rate per million man hours. And leading on from that, some good solid financial numbers, which Gavin will discuss in a little bit more detail in a minute. But the highlights, revenue of $170 million. An EBITDA, an EBITDA sorry, from that of $95.7 million, which is 56% margin. We continue to pay down our debt. We took on approximately $200 million of debt when we acquired SASA in 2017. We've now got that down to, at the year end, a net debt position of $36.2 million and a gross debt position of $80.4 million. And against that very strong background as well, we had the confidence with high commodity prices at the moment and a good forward-looking forecast to actually announce a dividend, a final dividend for 2020 of eight pence, making 14 pence in total for the whole of 2020. And on that note, I'll hand over to Gavin to give a bit more detail on the financial numbers. Thanks, Nigel. Well, 2020 was a fairly challenging year, primarily because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's reflected in the metal prices that we received throughout the year, where we effectively split it into two halves. If we look at the charts on the right-hand side of that slide, um, the dotted lines represent the average prices received for the metals over those periods, and you can see significant increases in the prices received for all three metals, uh, copper, zinc, and lead in the second half of 2020. Uh, however, copper um, outperformed, really, and uh, as, a, as a result of global stimulus packages and ramp up of vaccination programs, and we ended up the year receiving a price that was higher than we did in 2019. So the average price received $6,184 there. Whereas the lead and zinc, in spite of that rally that you see in the second half, uh, of 2020, the average price received through the year was actually lower than we received in 2019, and that feeds through into the income statement, which I'll talk about next. The other macro issue that faced, faced us and every other lens uh, concentrate producer, frankly, was a, a large increase in treatment charges. These are the costs that the smelters levy to convert our concentrate into metal, and we saw a 63% increase in TCs year on year. The outlook uh, for 2021 is far more favorable as we revert to a more balanced supply and demand market for those concentrates. Uh, on the other hand, we did uh, benefit from a slight tailwind uh, in, in the form of the Kazakh Tengi, uh, which depreciated further from the 2019 average of 383 to an average of 413 through 2020 and 70% Although that does affect our cost base in Kazakhstan slightly. If we go to the income statement, 
as I said before, those metal prices um, in the first half led to that decrease period on period uh, in revenue from 180.8 in 2019 to 170.3 dollars. And also embedded within that figure is those treatment charges I was talking about earlier. You can see selling and distribution costs have gone up um, what looks like significantly, although the dollar amounts are fairly modest. But that is because we've started to sell concentrate into the Asian market, both China and South Korea taking lead and zinc concentrates, whereas before we were selling more into the Balkan and European market. Um, the benefits uh, of those sales um, are again embedded in the revenue where we received lower, lower treatment charges for those sales as well. On a segmental basis, Conrad, you can see the revenue up year on year from 81.7 to 87.7, again, as a result of those higher copper prices, but also higher sales volumes year on year, where we actually had to increase our um, guidance from 12.5 to 13.5, uh, where we uh, ended up producing about 13,800 tons of copper. There. EBITDA margin of 75% at Conrad is, is outstanding. And the opposite, uh, unfortunately, at Sasa, where the lead and zinc prices and treatment charges uh, contrived to give us a lower revenue number of 82.6 against 99.1 in the previous year. Um, however, we still have a very good margin of that minor 51%. So we go to the EBITDA evolution. Um, I won't dwell on this for too long, but you can see the 108.6 million that we got in 2019, um, affected by uh, Increase in the copper revenue, but more than offset by decreases in lead zinc revenue and those treatment charges I spoke about earlier to get you down to the 95.7 million. Now, one of the reasons that uh, central Asian metals is a very high margin and benefit from that 56 to an EBITDA margin is the low cost at Kunrad. Um, we can see that costs have remained flat year on year, 52 cents. Last year, 51 cents in 2020, uh, leading to that 75% EBITDA margin. Now, if we plotted this asset on a copper cost curve, it would be right, right down at the lowest end of the cost curve um, for pure copper producers. I think this is a, a, one of the lowest cost pure copper producers in the world. And we move on to the zinc at Sasa, where we report a zinc equivalent to cash cost, where we effectively apportion all the costs of production to the um, proportion of zinc revenue, which you can see in the second line of that uh, table on the right hand side, we end up with a C1 cash cost of 50 cents per pound, which again is right at the, um, just outside the first quartile of uh, cost curve in, in zinc producers. So again, a very low cost producer. If you look at the pie chart, the biggest chunk there is that realization cost, that is those treatment charges I was talking about. If we go to the third last line of the table, you can actually see we've exercised very good cost control through the year. 2019, $40.3 per tonne. 2020, $39.2 per tonne. And this is the cost on site of mining, processing, and local DNA to produce a tonne of concentrate. Um, the realization cost in the second last line, again, you can see that large increase that I spoke about before from $16.3 million to $25.6 million through the year, driving that SASA C1 cost up by three cents year on year to 50 cents a pound. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the slide for too long, but um, again, just to contextualize Central Asia Metals in, in the sort of mining market, a dollar 15 of C1 equivalent cash cost is still very much at the a lower end of the range um, industry-wide. And if you think about where the copper price is in terms of dollars per pound now, you can immediately see the margins that we enjoy as a company. The C1 cost um, rise of 22% is largely attributable to those treatment charges, which uh, accounts for 14 cents of that rise. The other seven cents is the conversion of lead and zinc into copper, um, where the prices of lead and zinc have moved relatively down in relation to copper moving relatively up. Um, the MET charge you see there is effectively the royalty which we pay to the Kazakh government for extraction of copper. So that is a 5.7% royalty. Concession fees, the line above that, have remained flat, um, but the MET has gone up because of higher sales volumes and also copper price. Loan interest has come down as we repay that loan. Um, the, as the loan balance goes down, clearly the interest charges go down. 
And as you can see everywhere else, we remain more or less flat in terms of cost control. So if we move on to the CapEx for the business, again, given the challenges that COVID-19 presented, we went uh, through an exercise of identifying cost savings uh, and we managed to not only identify um, some genuine savings here, but there's also some deferrals that will be going through into 2021. But uh, the original guidance of 12 to 14 million dollars for CapEx across the group, we actually turned out 8.5 million dollars. So we, we will see guidance going up in 2021. If you see that little blue box on the left hand side, bottom left of the, the, um, on the slide, that is due to that two to three million dollars that's being carried over, but also due to a large capital program uh, being carried out at SASA um, to effect a transition from sublevel cave mining into carbon fill mining. What we did do last year is made sure that the assets were adequately invested in, and we spent seven point two million dollars at SASA. A lot of that is on new mining equipment and underground fleet but also importantly on underground development to ensure that we didn't get behind on development um, at Sasa. And in Kunrad, there was a replacement program for some of the anodes, which contributed largely to that $1.3 million that you saw us spend there. Balance sheet looking really healthy. As Nigel said at the outset, we've continued to repay debt. Uh, in spite of the cash present, uh, preservation activities I've spoken about, we've continued to repay the usual rate of $3.2 million a month bringing gross debt to 80.4 million, which is made up of 70.7 million of corporate debt to Traxxas. And we also drew down $9.7 million of overdraft facilities in North Macedonia to provide us with additional liquidity. We expect the um, debt repayments in 2021 to continue at that rate of $3.2 million a month, uh, which should uh, take us through to the end of the life of the debt November 2022, where we'll get down to zero balance there. And lastly, the cash flow, um, which is uh, important for us because that's where we calculate the dividend from. Operating cash flow was $87 million. If we deduct the income tax and interest and the capex from that, we'll get to our free cash flow figure of 58.9 million. Um, and we pay the AP dividend on the basis of that number, and we're slightly outside the range of 57% this year, but that was to reflect the sort of extraordinary circumstances over the last couple of years, really. We did reinstate that dividend, uh, we paid $13.9 million to shareholders in December, and the debt I've spoken about, that was the other big um, cash flow item there, taking us down to a closing cash balance of $47.9 million at the end of the year. So thanks, Nigel, I'll hand back to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Gavin. So as you can see, a, a solid set of financial numbers there from Gavin. So just moving swiftly on to sustainability and our ESG activities across the group, something we've put a lot of focus on over the past 18 months to two years. We have a good track record on this. We've had a what's known as a CSR director on site at Coomad since 2012. CSR standing for Corporate Social Responsibility, including all the aspects of the community involvement, the environmental aspects of our operations, and also health and safety on site. So good track record of doing that on the ground, but we have recognized that investors are paying particular focus to ESG and sustainability activities in all groups to for them to become investable in effectively. And just listed out here some of the key activities that we undertook over the past year and our outlook for the future. And just to pick up on a couple of those things, we did put out our first sustainability report April of 2020. Uh, we'll be putting out our second report in April of 2021, and that will be uh, to GRI reporting standards. We also undertook uh, an evaluation effectively of what was our desktop exercise, informing us of what we thought were the material topics for that first sustainability report. And this was done by an external firm of consultants called ERM, just to confirm that what we thought was the material topics internally from the desktop review were indeed what the stakeholders, both internal and external, thought, and we'll come on to that in the next slide. Uh, we also appointed for the first time a group people manager to look after the welfare and the training and development and induction programs for all of the people joining the CAMEL group. We now have over a thousand people employed across the group. We committed towards reporting to the global tailing standards, which came out last August. Uh, that's a three-year compliance with those standards 
and we've got a plan in place to actually deliver our own reporting standards to to that um, that level of quality effectively and we did some work on some renewable energy sources at Coonrad uh, and looking at the op opportunity and the options that we have to actually improve our uh, management of climate risk and our lowering of our own carbon footprint from uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That, that piece of work is still ongoing and we're working with an external firm called Climate Risk Services to understand the market better and see what we as a company of our size and our footprint and where we operate in Kazakhstan and North Macedonia, what we can do to make our contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions practically speaking. So a lot of work going on in this area and just turning to the next slide if you will Louise just to emphasize the key topics that we think are important to our stakeholders, as I say, both internally and externally, they're all in that top right-hand quadrant there. And if you look at those, they really do emphasize what we thought would be the key topics when we did the desktop review. So we're looking at how can we implement a strategy to deal with greenhouse gas emissions? How can we improve maybe our waste management through the management of the tailing process? How can we look at the water management on both sides and improve on that? We've already got a good track record on health and safety on site and looking after the well-being of our staff. So that's something that's important to us. And also finally, in that top quadrant or just edging onto it, is community relationships and dealing with the community and investing back into the local community, which we've again got a good track record on. Health and safety won't dwell too long on this, but we had a good year last year with zero LTIs at both operations. We've now gone by the end of December 2020 uh, 702 days at SASA since the last incident and 959 days at, at Coonrad. So a good performance last year on the health and safety on site. Some of you on the call will know that we did actually, unfortunately, have an incident in September 2020 uh, where we had a minor leakage at our TSF4 facility. Um, we've actually repaired the facility and we've you know, de dealt closely with the local authority and put all any uh, improvements that we needed to do for the actual operation in place during Q4 of 2020. What we still have work to do on is the river remediation work and this year we'll be focusing on removing any uh, of the last five percent or so of tailings. We estimate that we've removed by the end of last year about 95 percent of the tailings that polluted the river and we'll also be doing work on biodiversity and working continuing to work should I say with the local community on making sure we maintain their goodwill and deliver on all the objectives we set, set out at the time of the incident back in September 2014, sorry, September 2020. This is another part of that uh, particular uh, goodwill aspect back to the community. We've uh, uh, agreed to invest up to $150,000 on, on a community project down by the riverside in the town, which is a children's uh, play park and just a recreational area for the people of the town to go and enjoy uh, the river and be outside on, on the park there. And that's something we've committed to. And last but by no means least on uh, sustainability, um, we've got a good track record of investing back in the communities that support us in the local areas. And last year, a lot of the focus of that uh, support was on, on assisting with COVID-19. We spent approximately $500,000 in the two communities and about 60% of that or $300,000 was in various initiatives to help with COVID-19, be it from the purchase of machines to help in hospitals or actual money donated to the Ministry of Health in North Macedonia as a COVID-19 fund. So various initiatives all to help the people out there, along with ongoing support for the community, which is something we've been doing um, since 2012. Just moving on to the operations themselves. Uh, first of all, Kunrad, which is a, uh, uh, an in-situ in leach project in Kazakhstan between Almaty and Nur Sultan. Uh, this is an aerial shot which shows the old open pit from which we process the waste dumps from that old open pit. So you can see in the centre of the picture the pit, which just to put it into context, is about 500 metres deep and about one and a half kilometres north to south and east to west. So a huge open pit that was mined since 1936. And all the waste that they couldn't process at the time, they dumped in a fairly organized manner on the surface to the east, which we call the eastern dumps, and to the southwest on the western dumps. Slightly different mineralogy and metallurgical characteristics of, of the, the uh, waste that's been put on those eastern and western dumps. And what we built back in 2010-11 and put into production in 2012 
was what's known as an SXEW plant, solvent extraction, electro winning, which produces from the copper we pick up in solution from those dumps, pure copper cathodes, and then we ship it out to the end market through an off-taker. We have an estimated recoverable amount of copper at these dumps at the moment of 140,000 tonnes and a life of mine out to 2034. Just looking at the uh, production profile, you can see that it is seasonal. It gets extremely cold in the winter, down to minus 30, uh, and extremely you know, warm in the summer. So a big variation in temperature ranges. It can be anything thing from plus 30, plus 35 in the summer months. We do produce throughout the year, even in the cold, we maintain production. Uh, we've got strong availability on the plant. And just some facts and figures there of, of what we actually do on the eastern dumps, as I say, slightly different from the western dumps, different heights, different recovery percentages that we estimate, and different leach times. And our guidance this year for the copper output is 12,500 tonnes to 13,500 tonnes of pure copper. Final slide on Coonrad, really just highlighting a few statistics, really, since we started in 2012, the amount of area that we've had under leach at any one time, which is constantly increasing. The number of drippers where we irrigate the dumps, and that's the phrase we use, irrigating, putting this highly diluted sulfuric acid onto the dumps to pick up the copper. We've now got 6,500 kilometres of those pipelines, and that's a distance from London to the capital of Kazakhstan, near Sultan. We've steadied out on the grade and we've steadied out more or less on the area under leach and the volume under leach. Uh, and now we're, the phrase I use, which Gary laughs about often, is a set fair <laughs> as a project out to 2034 with minimal investment required in any capex. And the project is fully developed effectively at those levels of output right through to the end of the license period. Annual sustaining capex of the magnitude of about $2 million per annum. Moving on to Sasa, different operation. It's an underground uh, zinc and lead mine. We acquired this for $402.5 million back in November 2017. We've now owned it for three and a half years. Uh, there are three ore bodies, as you can see on the diagram there, um, Spinureka, Kozureka, and Galemareka. We're currently only operating on the Spinureka ore body, but all three ore bodies in the past, historically, have been mined at some stage. And this is a, an old mine going back to the 60s that was mined by the local government and then various companies before we acquired it in 2017. On the production statistics, just on the next slide, again, a good track record and a consistent record of its output of zinc and lead. And last year we produced 820,000, sorry, we, we mined, should I say, apologies, we mined 826,000 tonnes of ore from the mine and we put through the process plant 820,000 tonnes of, uh, of ore as well. Fairly consistent combined grades of zinc and lead of about 7%, and the output there, as you can see, 23,815 tonnes of zinc and just under 30,000 tonnes of lead. Our guidance for this year is 23,000 to 25,000 tonnes of zinc in concentrate and 30 to 32,000 tonnes of lead in concentrate. And again, the final slide on SASA, really. Um, as I say, we've owned it almost for three years. We have been looking throughout a long, a long period of that to uh, see where we can improve operations, what can we do to optimise the way we mine the ore body, the way we process the, uh, the ore that we mine, and the way we manage the tailings on site. And we've um, approved at board level last August to move to a method of mining called cut and fill, away from what we currently do, which is sub-level caving. It's a safer method of mining, it's a more accurate method of mining, which will recover more metal from the ore that we actually physically mine therefore less waste, but it's also a more efficient uh, way of managing the waste, whereby up to 40%, possibly slightly more on certain years, will be put back underground in the form of a paste, and therefore it reduces the environmental footprint of managing the tailings on surface, or traditional tailings down, and we're looking at dry stack tailings as well to manage another element of the, uh, the tailings facilities. The transitional period will go this year and next year will be the capital investment around about $19 million to build the backfill plant, put in the reticulation pipe work, do the work on the dry stack tailing facilities to so another filtration plant, and also build a new decline to access the ore body below the 830 level. That's all costing, as I say, in the two years, around about $19 million we've costed for that. There will then be a two year transition period we ramp up the operation from its current output of around about 825,000 tonnes per annum up to 900,000 tonnes per annum. 
We do expect a slight increase in operational costs, but we expect that fully to be offset by the increased production of metal over the life of mine out to 2037. So as you can see from Gavin's part of the presentation, strong financial numbers, strong operation. We put a lot of focus on sustainability, but our strategy as a business moving forward is to grow the business effectively. And when we look at what we're here for and what our purpose in life is, which we believe is to produce base metals from a very safe and sustainable environment that are used in modern living, the things we currently focus on from a strategic point of view is safety on site, sustainability of all our operations, low cost environment, high margins, and ensuring that uh, we manage the cash flow that we generate from those operations sensibly in terms of capital allocation. And I'll touch on that in a minute, how we manage the capitalization, capital allocation Sorry, from a, from a board perspective. The bigger challenge we've got strategically is how we grow the business from this point and how we deliver growth for all our shareholders and all our stakeholders as we move forward to try and grow from the current size of business to generate more profits and more returns for our shareholders. So capital allocation, uh, not to labor the point on this, but since we went into production in 2012, we've been paying money back to our shareholders from the cash flows we've generated first at Kunrad and now at Sasa. And in that time, we've paid back $210 million almost, or 112 pence per share, back to the shareholders. We have a policy that is that we pay back 30 to 50% of the free cash flow. Uh, but as Gavin mentioned, and I think I mentioned myself, the dividend that we've just announced yesterday of eight pence for final for 2020 or 14 pence for the full year is actually 57%, which is a, an indication of our confidence as a board and a management team looking forward with the commodities that we produce, the prices of those commodities, and the cash basis and the debt repayments that we need to make in the in the next few years. We continue to deliver the balance sheet, Gavin's already mentioned that, and we ended the year with $80 million of gross debt, having paid off $38 million last year and indeed for the previous two years since acquiring SASA. Third leg of, uh, ca of our capital allocation strategy is to reinvest back in the business, which we do every year, but these next two years are particularly uh, heavy for us in terms of capex as we bring SASA into the 21st century and deliver on the cut and fill transition that I mentioned before to make it a safer operation, get maximum extraction of the metals and improve the both environmental storage of the tailings and also the economic viability of how we manage that tailings aspect of the business. So that's a $19 million capex program between this year and next year. And then onto this challenge that I mentioned before, which is how we grow the business from here. We recognize that you know size and liquidity in the capital markets is becoming a big challenge for companies and we need to address that. And therefore we are putting quite a bit of energy at the moment from the management team to look for the future opportunities. Our preferred metal of the three that we currently produce is copper, uh, but we need to be you know, fairly broad minded about the opportunities for growing the business in terms of jurisdiction, metals and where they sit on the development curve. At the moment, our preferred metal, as I say, is copper, ideally towards close to cash flow development and production and in the end jurisdictions that we're you know comfortable with the ones we currently operate in europe and the balkans and kazakhstan but we would look further afield in the american areas and also into africa finally um before we go to questions really just an outlook for the business um, i think hopefully you've taken away a picture that we are a, a strong and sustainable business we've got a very good platform from which to grow low cost production, uh, strong and disciplined capital allocation priorities, good dividends paid back to shareholders, 14 pence for 2020 is 57% of our free cash flow going back to the shareholders. And we are now in a position where from that position of strength, we can look for growing uh, growth opportunities for the business to move to the next level. And on that point, I think I'll stop talking and open it up to questions from the floor. Nigel, Gavin, thank you very much indeed for the update and your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review investor questions submitted through the meeting, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity 
opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, Nigel, Gavin, the, the investors had the ability to pre-submit questions. We received one ahead of today's event, which if I could before looking at the live Q&A, um, and I think you have definitely touched on this within the presentation, but the question reads, has the River Remediation Programme implemented following the TSF4 incident now being completed? And how is your biodiversity programme progressing? Um, the answer to that is, is no, it's not completed, as I mentioned, and uh, we will expect to complete it this, this year. We've put in what's known as a, an ESDA, which is an Environmental and Social Damage Assessment Report produced for us by a number of companies, actually, Wardle Armstrong being one, and some local companies on environmental uh, experts and consultants into the government. And we're following the recommendations and the actions coming out of that to complete that this year with, as I said before, biodiversity plans, We've got plans to uh, plant, I think it's 3,000 trees, 250 bushes, plant 320 kilograms of grass seed. So a number of things and, and make sure that we deliver on our promises from that ESDA report. So that will be done this year. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, if I could ask, perhaps if I could hand over to Louise now to look at the Q&A that's come in during the live event. If I could just remind you to please read out the question, perhaps who it's from and where appropriate, give a response and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. Sure, thanks Mark. Um, so the first question I've got on here is from Michael C. And the question is, what was the net financial cost of the TSF4 incident? Um, the answer to that is $700,000 effectively to repair the dam and do the initial removal of tailings from the river, of which I said before we have estimated 95% by the end of the year. So that was $700,000. We also invested about 200,000, which was capitalized in pumps and everything for water management of the lagoon and at the tailings facility. We estimate this year maximum of up to $500,000 that we'll spend on the additional river remediation work. So in essence, around about $1.2 to $1.5 million is what it's directly cost us. Uh, in terms of lost revenue, Gavin and his team have estimated, given the uh, metal prices at the time, we lost about eight days of production. We estimated that came to about 1.8 million net revenue, but that's more a lost opportunity and a deferred revenue. Um, didn't directly cost us, but that's something which we're, uh, we're happy to, to share with the public really in terms of what our views are on the cost of the incident. And the next question is from Nick J, um, and it says, great operational performance. What do you see as the greatest risk to the company as you move through 2021 into 2022? Well, thank you very much for the uh, the compliment, first of all. I, I suppose when you're running a mining company, you're always, you know, you get a few sleepless nights and things which go on. Um, but, you know, I think we've, we've got good procedures on site. We've got good safety procedures, as you've seen from our track record. And um, we have good operational management, good, good site management. So I don't see any major specific risks uh, other than managing the business as sensibly as we have over the past, you know, past, past periods, really, that we've reported upon. Um, Simon C is asking for our view on share buybacks and our plans for any potential M&A. Sure. Thanks, Simon. Uh, we've discussed share buybacks as a board several times, and in fact, I think as a company, have performed with exactly one early on in its genesis. But uh, in essence, we don't see a huge amount of value in terms of buying back shares, and we also tend to run a, a really modest working capital balance anyway that effectively covers us for a, a few months rather than a few years and we sort of capital allocation wise as Nigel was describing in the presentation is really focused towards debt, dividends and, and investing in the business. As to the m and I think again that was probably covered uh, in, in, the, uh, in the presentation. Yes, we are definitely out there looking for things. Um, you know, our view as management is that we Prefer copper, um, jurisdictionally, you know, this time zone, potentially the Americas, uh, Kazakhstan clearly, and uh, I think the main thing to take away is that, you know, whatever we do, we'll make sure it's appreciative to share with us. Yeah, it's a good point, yeah. Um, Our next couple of questions are both from Mazin S. The first one is, can you give any more colour on treatment costs? Are they now lower than last year? And the next question from Maziness, I think we have answered. It was what revenue was lost due to the incident at Sasa 
are there any significant one-off costs in SGNA as a result of that incident? I think we'll we'll kind of pass on that one because I think Nigel already answered that um, mm. as well in terms of lost revenue. So um, Gavin will comment now on uh, treatment costs being are they now lower than last year? Yeah. So thanks for the question, Liz. And I think <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a good question because it is a, a large part of the cost base at SASA. The treatment costs 2019 to 2020 rose by 63%. Uh, we're expecting uh, the new contracts to reflect about a 30% decrease from the current level, so effectively getting more or less back to where we were in 2019, which is uh, a much more balanced market, let's put it that way. So it's all about, as I said earlier, the concentrate supply and demand balances, and we think those uh, uh, treatment charges that we have negotiated um, for the next year or so are reflective of that and hopefully will sort of persist into the long term. Chris T is asking um, if we could comment on our rationale for the hedge. Um, he says, as an investor in Camel, then I'm looking for exposure to any upside in the copper price, so it was a bit disappointing to see that reduced. Yeah, Chris, it's Gavin here again. Thanks for the question. I think it's, a, again, a good one. And as, as a board, what we were doing with the uh, the hedge there was really sort of defending a position where, for the first time in, in quite a long time, Camel had a, a third pillar of capital allocation, whereas before it was really debt and dividend, we added the capital expenditure at SASA into the mix. And in order to sort of just ensure that we could get through 2021 um, with those three pillars intact, the, the decision was made to hedge. Now. We have left 70% of the production exposed to spot prices, so you will definitely be benefiting from the current spot prices as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Steve White is asking mm -hmm. us whether we have any rights to the old Kunrad mine itself. Um, no, we don't, is the answer to that, Steve, and thanks for the question, and nor do we have the liabilities from the open pit either. So our area is quite well defined in terms of the dump area itself. That's where our liabilities for restoring it on the end of the life of mine will be. Um, and in terms of you know um, opportunities in the in the mine itself, it's 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 owned by Kazakh Mist. So we do liaise with Kazakh Mist. We do talk to them. If there were opportunities to do any leaching, we'd have to have conversations with them and come to some kind of mutual uh, agreement on that. But we don't have any rights as such legally, nor do we have any uh, obligations either. Um, Michael C is asking if we're looking at possible merger rather than growth through uh, an acquisition. Um, <laughs> by that probably you mean like a combination of equals, a merger of equals kind of thing, where normally there is one company acquiring the other, however we wish to choose to phrase it really. But, but yeah, I think, you know, this is a personal view I've shared and I'll happily share with this audience really, is that much as you saw in the gold space, you may well see in the base metal space, an element of consolidation which may lead to mergers, acquisitions, call them what you will. And I don't think we're averse to that. If it's appropriate for our business and value adding and accretive for our shareholders and it makes a stronger business. As I said, I think in the presentation, one of the challenges not just ourselves is facing in the capital markets is this space whereby you need to get to the next level because of scale and liquidity becoming ever more important for certain fund managers and passive investments and all the other things which are changing the dynamics of the market. Amazing S has asked another question, which is what size of acquisition are you looking at? Would you use new equity to finance it? Okay. Um, what size? Um, we're comfortable with certainly the size that we did when we acquired SASA three years ago and probably above and beyond that really. Um, in terms of that was a $400 million acquisition when we were a company, I think Gavin phrased it well before in a previous presentation, we were a company at that time of a market cap around about $300 million. We're slightly higher market cap now so we would go above and beyond the 400 million but i think there comes a point whereby we may be stretching ourselves too much and certain assets will be outside our reach or what the a prudent board that me and gavin have to report to will be comfortable with i think it's fair to say so putting that in monetary terms maybe anywhere between four to seven hundred million dollars i think will be the kind of sweet spot for us in terms of getting to the next level in terms of using new equity i think we have a a very strong shareholder base. I think we have a very supportive shareholder base as well. And we would clearly, in any acquisition of that magnitude, look to a combination of debt and equity, as we did at the time of SASA, and look to our shareholders to support us 
and therefore we've got to sell that opportunity to them uh, in terms of the benefit it will bring to them. So I think, yes, we would look to raising new equity while all the time having in the back of our mind that we must make sure it's accretive and that we don't you know, do anything that's too dilutive for the current shareholders. Stuart M is asking, are there any other similar dump opportunities in Kazakhstan available? Um, <laughs> we get asked this question a lot, actually, and it is a good question. Um, I, I can't say for sure that there aren't any, uh, but I can certainly say for sure that we've not found one that matches Kuhnma um, at the moment, and we have looked. Um, we are fortuit fortuitous, I think it's fair to say, in terms of the metallurgy and the ground conditions and everything else associated with with Kunrad in terms of you know its, its consumption of acid and the reagents and everything we do at Kunrad. So we've, there's an element of serendipity and we've managed it well, but we continue to look. We haven't yet come across anything with the same characteristics, but that, that's not to say that they aren't out there. Um, uh, Peter O is um, asking us um, if we are considering a move from um, AIM to the main market uh, potentially increasing routes for funding and further liquidity and with a particular angle towards uh, improved ESG? Um, I think in answer to that question, thank you, you know, in terms of saying well done to the team, we appreciate the, the feedback. Um, and I think we are putting, as you rightly say, the emphasis back onto sustainability because we recognise that, you know, without doing that, we companies will become uninvestable almost really. Uh, consideration moving to the main market, we've discussed it several times at board level. Don't think it's appropriate at the moment given where we are, um, but it's not something that we discount in the future and we may well look to do that in the future. I think we'd look more to do it in the future with a, an additional acquisition and getting to the next, 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 uh, next level of market cap effectively. Yeah, I think there's one thing to add on that um, in terms of you know the ESG and the governance angle. Um, not being on the main market doesn't mean that we wouldn't try to report and um, yeah, you know go point. over and above what is uh, necessarily required of us. For example, with our sustainability report, we don't have to report one of those, but we choose to, um, and we want to go and above and be seen to be a good um, a good performer in terms of ESG, irrespective of which market we're listed on. Yeah, good, um, good point, Louise. We've got one final question here from Alex T, who says, would we consider paying dividends on a more regular basis, i.e. perhaps quarterly, as opposed to um, every six months with an interim and a final? Um, short answer to that is uh, we've not actually considered doing that, Alex. Um, I don't think it's something that we are looking at. Uh, I personally am quite comfortable with doing an interim and a final. I have no real desire to move towards a quarterly dividend at the moment. I know companies do do it, but it's not something which either we've thought about or is, is something I would necessarily want to consider at the moment. Louise, if it's uh, sensible for me to jump in at this point, you've been very generous with your time and it, and it looks like you've addressed every question that's been submitted uh, during the event by investors. So thank you uh, to the investors for submitting those questions and obviously to the management team for, for addressing them so openly. Um, perhaps before I redirect investors to give feedback, I know feedback is particularly important. Perhaps I could hand back to you, Nigel, just for a few closing comments and then I'll close the session. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, closing comments. Hopefully... You've enjoyed the presentation. You can see we have got a strong business, um, some good results that we've announced in very difficult circumstances, i.e. last year with COVID-19 and our incident that we had at, uh, at SASA. And we have a solid business moving forward, really, with low costs, long lives of the mines, a uh, strong balance sheet, a good management team, a good track record, good shareholder support from the institutions here in London. So we, we're in a strong position to look for that next opportunity, and that's what we intend to do over the coming months and, and years effectively. No particular rush on doing that, but we do recognise there's a window of opportunity here to move to that next level and, and move the business forward from a, a very solid base. And uh, thank you for listening and, um, and uh, yeah. That's brilliant. Nigel, um, Gavin and Louise, thank you so much for your time today and for updating investors as part of your roadshow. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, then the feedback page will appear. If you access this meeting via the link sent you by email, you'll simply be asked to log back in to submit your feedback. And I'm sure it'll be greatly appreciated by the company that they can better understand your views and expectations. On behalf of the management team of Central Asia Metals, I'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all.